السلام ورحمة الله. يفيد الله. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الله أكبر. الله أكبر. الله أكبر. الله أكبر. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن Please do me a favor. Um, when Abu Hanif finish praying, tell him I want his son to lead the salah. Please. Sorry to send him message. Okay? Inshallah. على الصلاة لا حول ولا أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Certainly all praises are for Allah Certainly it is the job, the duty, and of course the honor, and the pleasure, the splendor, and the enjoyment for the Muslim to praise his Lord. We as Muslims seek Allah's help. We seek his protection. We seek his aid. We seek his divine guidance. We ask Allah for help. The help in the beginning, before we embark upon an affair, we ask for law for help whilst we're doing a task and performing a job. And we ask Allah to allow us to help us in completing and perfecting that duty, that task, and that job of the deen and of the dunya. We seek Allah's help for all of our affairs, from the biggest to the smallest, from the heaviest to the lightest. And if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if it's not for Allah's help, nothing would be possible. We ask Allah to protect us from the evils of our souls and from the consequences of our poor decisions and our bad actions, things that we didn't give enough thought before saying or doing. We didn't reflect on the consequence, on the danger. We didn't give the necessary amount of deliberating, thinking about it, being slow in one's deliberations, and being swift in one's executions, thinking, pondering, reflecting, and calculating, asking Allah for help. Is it a good move? Is it a wise move? And then once you're ready, 
Once you feel that you've done everything that you can possibly do, you put your trust in Allah and you move forward. I bear witness and I testify that Allah alone without any partner deserves to be worshipped. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone without any partner deserves to be followed and deserves to be obeyed and deserves for one to love him more than his own parents, more than his own children, more than his own family, his own race, his own tribe, his own clan, his own friends, his own wealth. He has to love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anyone else. May Allah azza wa jal mention his name and extol his name and make his name high and lofty among the angels and the best from among the angels. And may the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam honor his name in this world among the human beings and the jinn. And may Allah humiliate and may Allah make base and mean those who try to mock, make fun of and belittle our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to proceed. It isn't strange, brothers and sisters, for us as human beings to understand a basic simple concept. And that basic simple concept is, is that it's natural for you to love someone who does good for you and who helps you out, who looks out for you, who's there for you. A simple example for this, and there are many, is a wealthy man and a poor man. A man who's poor, who's not that fortunate, he's unfortunate. Some people say not that lucky. And they may even give him a bad name or a bad term or title, a bum, a beggar. On the streets, help me out with a cup of coffee, with a dollar, help me get something to eat. Can you help me get to where I'm trying to get to, to my destination, etc., etc. This poor man may sit and beg from early in the morning until late at night. And out of the hundreds of people who walk by this poor man, if not thousands in New York City, only a few will give him some change or a dollar or I'll walk you into McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts and I'll buy you a cup of coffee. What would you like to eat? I'll pay for your train ticket, etc. So it's only natural for this poor man or this poor woman to love and to be connected and to have a bond and an attachment to the one that gives him or her a dollar every morning and every day. That's natural. Totally natural and easy for us to understand as human beings. And I'm sure you have experienced in your life, whether you've experienced it yourself, or whether you've seen others go through it, the day in which someone drops their wallet, or leaves their keys in their car, or forgets something, or someone is trying to do something bad to their property, that bum, quote unquote, or that beggar, quote unquote, will be the one who will protect their wealth. We'll run and chase after them, hey, you dropped your wallet. We'll run and chase after them, and here are your car keys. We'll call the police. We'll be a lookout for that person that the thief or the one who's trying to do harm to you or your property overlooked the bum of the beggar. And that's because he's connected and attached to the one who did good to him. That's natural. And that's easy for us to understand. But if the bum of the beggar does not return the wallet or does not help him out or look out for him, is it natural for the rich person or the wealthy person or the one who gave the charity, is it natural for him to love the bum and the beggar? Is that natural? Is it natural for the one who gives his money to love the one whom he gave the money to? Is that natural? In most cases, that's not. And that's a bit more difficult to understand and to comprehend. The one on the receiving end, for sure, it's natural for him to love the one who gives, period. And we can comprehend that as humans. But for the one who needs not the beggar, the one who's totally self-sufficient, he has no want, no need, no desire for the one that he gives charity to. How and when will he love him and be attached to him, so on and so forth? Can we understand that as humans? We are poor. We are needy. We beg every single day. And Allah Azza wa doesn't just give to us. He doesn't just bless us. He doesn't just bestow upon us and endow us. Rather, Allah, the mighty and the most high, loves us. Inshallah, us specifically. But as a general rule, his servants, his slaves, the believers, he loves them. He's fond of them. He protects them. He's there for them. And what do we do for Allah? What does Allah need from us? How are we helping out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are we doing for him? And did Allah ask us and beg us for anything? So how can this be? 
Think about the comparison now among humans. The beggar, it's natural for him to love the one that gives him money. But how about the one that gives the beggar the money? Is that natural for him to say, hey, how you doing? I missed you. How's it going? So on and so forth. To sit and to talk with that beggar. It's strange. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in his Quran, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ basir. There's nothing like unto Allah. There's no comparison between the human being and between Allah the mighty and the most high. There is no similitude between what we know, what we understand, what we comprehend, our language, and between the reality of Allah, the mighty, and the most high. That's a strange relationship for the one giving to be loving to the one that he gives versus the one who's receiving to love the one who gives him. So when you make a sin, when you make a mistake, it is your job to do what? To return to Allah, to repent to Allah. It's your job to destroy and to get rid of whatever tool or device or means that you use to disobey him, the mighty and the most. That's your duty. And when you do your duty, you return to Allah, you make tawbah as you were supposed to do, Allah Azza wa Jal will love you. Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin. Allah loves those who make tawbah constantly and abundantly. Think about that now. Think about how the Muslim is never, ever in a state of loss. I make a sin. It's my job to fix and to correct that sin. Allah has ordered me to fix and to correct that sin. I return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not only has He promised me to accept my repentance, not only has He promised me to turn my bad deeds into good deeds, but He has also promised me to love me. That's something that takes a bit of thought. Because our world isn't as such. It's not like that. In most cases, those who are on the receiving end love those who give them. And oftentimes, not vice versa. So I want you brothers and sisters to, to ponder and to reflect over this reality that Allah loves for His servant to return back to Him when He's broken, when He's injured, when He has sinned, and when He has wronged Himself and He has disobeyed Allah Allah loves the servant to make tawbah, to proceed. فيقول الإمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى في جامعه الصحيح حدثنا قتيبة بن سعيد قال حدثنا المفضل بن فضالة عن أقيل عن ابن شهاب عن أروى عن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا أوى إلى فراشه كل ليلة جمع كفيه ثم نفث فيهما فقرأ فيهما قل هو الله أحد وقل أعوذ برب الفلق وقل أعوذ برب الناس ثم يمسح بهما ما استطاع من جسده يبدأ بهما على رأسه ووجهه وما أقبل من جسده ثلاث مرات أو يفعل ذلك ثلاث مرات أو كما قال بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بما فيه من الآيات والذكر الحكيم وأستغفر الله تعالى لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو البر التواب الحمد لله وكفاء والصلاة الله وسلامه على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد Brothers and sisters in al-Islam the main topic of today's khutbah, the subject of my sermon and my lecture towards you, is on one of the most important aspects of human life, for the Muslim and the non-Muslim alike. Not the only aspect of human life, not necessarily the most important aspect of human life, but for sure one of the most substantial and essential parts of our lives, as Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And this part of our life is the phenomenon or the epic or the advent of sleep, of nighttime, going to sleep. Something that if you pay attention to, most of the habits and most of the things that you perform today as a grown man or a grown woman are oftentimes based off of how you used to sleep and how you were taught to sleep and how you were nurtured to sleep as a young baby and a young child. That's a fact. So what do we do, brothers and sisters in Al-Islam? How do we sleep? As humans, let alone as Muslims. Do we just go to sleep, conk out, knock out, 
begin snoring, tossing and turning and dreaming? Is that it? Is that how we were raised? Is that how our mothers taught us to sleep? Or is there something bigger and deeper than that? The average human being has that which is called a sleep ritual. A sleep ritual. Something that you do every single night, five nights out of the week, that prepares you and gears you to go to sleep. It could be a food, a drink, an entire piece of clothing, something that you watch, something that you listen to, something that you read, something that you do before you sleep. And that thing allows you to sleep calmly, inshallah, peacefully, temporarily, ETC. Many Americans and many Muslims, they suffer from all types of sleep disorders, me being one of them, whether it be insomnia or apnea or other things which are irregular. And the first thing that the specialist is going to tell you when you say, I can't sleep at night, I, w I go to sleep and I wake up fatigued, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I have a migraine, I don't feel energized when I wake up. They're going to say that you need a sleep ritual. Every night you have to go to sleep at the same time. You have to wear the same pair of pajamas in the same bed, in the same room, at the same style, etc., 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 to train your body to sleep and to get the necessary rest. So, many of us, before we go to sleep, we like to watch TV, we like to watch movies, we like to watch shows, and that is why they have the night shows with this comedian with this broadcaster, with this host. That's a million, if not billion dollar business. And there are movies that come on at night. And there are many of us, before we go to sleep, we have to listen to a song. We have to listen to music to relieve the tension or the stress or the depression or the sadness, to be calmed down, etc. Some of us like to read at night. That's why they have night lights and reading lights, attachments and devices for you to read at nighttime. On your iPad, or your smartphone, or your tablet, they have a feature called night mode. It allows you to read your book without disturbing the person who's laying next to you. It's not too bright, let alone nature sounds and different things that soothe you and put you in the mood to get a good night's sleep, let alone the mattress business. How much money do they make on mattresses, orthopedic mattresses, mattresses that give you a massage, etc., etc., etc. There are clothes specifically geared towards sleep for men, for women, and for children. Weaning a breastfeeding child. What's the most difficult step in weaning a breastfeeding child except for what? When it's time to go to sleep. Often child, oftentimes the, the child doesn't need the milk. The child isn't necessarily hungry. The child doesn't need the nourishment, but its mother's warmth and comfort and tenderness and softness is the thing that allows the baby to sleep. When a child is being potty trained and taught how to use the bathroom by him or herself, one of the most difficult steps in that is what? Is sleep. When it's time to go to sleep. What are the times in which you're most vulnerable? You need the greatest amount of security and protection, except for when it's time to do what? Go to sleep. How much money do you pay in your home for security? Taking the necessary measures that no one attacks you, robs you, harms you, and violates you when you're trying to go to sleep. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So what is the sleep ritual for the Muslim brothers and sisters in al Islam? What are we supposed to do when we want to go to sleep? Before we go to sleep? When we need to go to sleep? There are many prophetic acts and prophetic practices and prophetic rituals that the average Muslim is heedless of, forgetful of, let alone those of us who don't even have a clue about what the Prophet did before he went to sleep. And then we claim to be upon the Sunnah. And from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is to do things before, during, after you sleep. Sleeping on the right side, making wudu, making ghusl, making tawbah, Making istighfar, saying, Sayyidul istighfar, Allahumma anta rabbi, la ilaha illa anta, khalaqtani, wa ana abduka, wa ana ala ahdika, wa wa'adika, mastata'tu. Reciting ayatul kursi. And there's so many different things that a Muslim should do before he or she sleeps. Making sure you have your will and testament, making sure, making sure, making sure, etc. 
and from the prophetic sleep ritual that many of us don't do, many of us don't know about, many of us are unaware of, is that which Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah has collected on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha, that she said, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, the friend of the Prophet, the student of the Prophet, the companion of the Prophet, she said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أوى إلى فراشه كل ليلة جمع كفيه أو يجمع كفيه Every single night whenever the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم wanted to go to sleep whether he was staying in my apartment, my house, my chamber or that of Umm Salama, Maymuna and the other of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, his other wives but every night that he was with me for sure he would do the following ritual, quote-unquote. He would gather his hands. He would put his hands together. He would cup his hands. Then after he cupped his hands, when he wanted to go to sleep, thumma nafatha fihima. And then he would breathe in his hands. He would breathe in his hands. So the Prophet wasallam he says, jama'a kafehi. He wouldn't have his hands like this, or like this, or like this. But he would hold them like this, cupping them. Thumma nafatha fihima. And then he would do a nafth. Pay close attention. There are three words mentioned in the hadiths with regards to blowing or spitting. And many Muslims, they do it improperly. Hunaka nafkhu. Wa hunaka nafthu. Wa hunaka taflu. A nafkh. Anafath wa tafal. Anafkh nun fa kha is blowing without spitting. Arih bidun arik. Bidun rik. Anafathu arihu ma shayin min arik. Light spit. And then there is tafal. Ta fa lam. In which the Prophet وسلم, in certain hadiths actually spat. Like Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu on the day of the battle of Khaybar, the conquest of Khaybar, Ali was sick, he was ill, and he was bothered by his eyes. Ali was a great warrior. How can a warrior fight without his eyes on the battlefield? And the Prophet says, where's Ali? Where's he at? Why isn't this brave lion sitting in front of me, prepared and ready to go to battle and ready to go to war? Where, where could he be? And they says, yes, taki aynehi. He's, he's bothered from his eyes, O Messenger of Allah. Okay, go bring him. Bring Ali to me. He brought Ali. Fatafatha o fabasaka. He spat in Ali's eyes. And Ali was immediately cured. So in this narration in Sayyid Bukhari, Aisha reports that the Prophet ﷺ would put his hands together. He would put his hands together. Then he would thumma nafatha fihima. He would blow in them and he would spit in them lightly. Lightly. Then Aisha radiallahu she says that he would recite فَقَرَأَ فِيهِمَا He would recite Qur'an and spit and blow in his hands from the following Qur'anic passages. Number one, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ Surah Al-Ikhlas And then he would recite قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ Surah Al-Falaq And then he would recite قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Surah Al-Nas Aisha radiallahu she says, is that when he recited, he blew, and he spat in his blessed hands, ثُمَّ يَمْسَحُ بِهِمَا مَسْتَطَاعَ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ And then he would wipe, he would rub, he would massage, he would caress, he would stroke any part of his body that he could touch. يَبْدَعُ بِهِمَا رَأْسَهُ The first part of his body that he would touch would be his head. وَوَجْهِهِ Then his face. وَمَا أَقْبَلَ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ And anything that was in the front part of his body. Did the Prophet wipe his back, his legs, the back of his body? Maybe. Perhaps. Is that permissible to do that? Maybe. But the hadith doesn't state that. The hadith clearly says, أَقْبَلَ That which was in the front of his body. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Aisha says that he would do this كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ Every single night. She says, ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتٍ Three times. So how do you do it? How do you make this recitation? And why do you make this recitation? And why is this such an important bedtime ritual for the Muslim? Inshallah, we'll try our best to answer these questions. 
First and foremost is, there are different ways and styles of performing this prophetic supplication. One way, and perhaps this is the closest, most original way, is to gather your hands. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, qul huwa Allah wahad, qul a'udhu bi rabbi falaq, qul a'udhu bi rabbi nasi, recite all three surahs, then you blow. Recite the Qur'an, then you spit in your hands, then you wipe your body. And that's one time, hadihi marra. Then you do it again. Reciting first, then blowing and spitting. Then reciting all the surahs, and that's two times until you complete three times. That's one interpretation of this hadith. Starting off with the qira'ah. Then, after you finish three, the three surahs, you blow and you spit lightly into your hands, your head, your face, and the front of your entire body until you do that three times. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation of this authentic hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ would recite the surahs separately, wipe separately three times. And another interpretation of this hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ, as the hadith clearly states, ثُمَّ Then he blew in his hands before he recited. Before he recited. And many scholars of hadith, they say that which is correct is that he recited, then he blew. He recited first, then he allowed the blessed air and the blessed breath and the blessed saliva after the Qur'an being recited to be on his hands and then upon his body. What's important is, if you wipe the front and the back, if you recite each surah separately, if you recite the surahs one, two, three, then wipe, one, two, three, then wipe, one, two, three, then wipe, kulluhu wasir. It's all permissible. It's all from the sunnah, insha'Allah ta'ala. But if you want to do the closest, the best thing, the most thorough, proper way, then I would say the first way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. So why did the Prophet ﷺ do this every single night? Was the Prophet not protected by Allah? Was he not kept safe by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did Allah not promise him that he would take care of him and look after him? What did the Prophet ﷺ have to seek Allah's refuge from? What was the Prophet ﷺ afraid of or scared of if he was afraid and if he was scared? First and foremost, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is a guide. He's an example. He's a role model. He's someone who would do things even if he didn't need to do them himself. He was commanded to say things and to do things that he already said, that he already did. Allah told him not to make shirk with him. Don't call upon other than Allah. Was the Prophet going to make shirk? Could the Prophet fall into shirk? But Allah reprimanded the Prophet, warned the Prophet, commanded the Prophet for us to take the example. If Allah told the Prophet not to do it, then how about us? If Allah commanded His Prophet and Messenger to seek His help, to seek His protection, then how about us? As Ibrahim والسلام, said, وَجَنُبْنِي وَبَنِيَّ أَنْ نَعْبُدُ الْأَصْنَامِ O oh Allah, protect me and my children. Protect me and my sons from worshipping idols. أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءِذْ حَضْرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ Or were you there when death came to Jacob? When he was upon his deathbed? What did Jacob say to his sons? He asked them what would they build? How would they spend the wealth? What did he ask them? He says, what will you worship after me? So who could be safe from shirk if Ibrahim was afraid of it? Who could feel safe from shirk if Ibrahim was scared of falling into it and his children? Who could feel safe from kufr and leaving Islam if Yaqub had to ask his own sons, what would they worship after me? That's obviously food for thought with regards to Wahhabi Islam. That's food for thought. Ibrahim was scared and afraid of falling into shirk. And you say there's no need to talk about shirk in the ummah. Shirk is gone. The Prophet ﷺ, he said towards the end of his life, Inna Iblisa, O Inna Shaytana, Qad Yaisa, and Yu'abada fi Jazirat al Arab. Walakinna Tahrisha Bainakum. The hadith states that Shaytan, the devil himself, he's lost hope and he's despaired of being worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula. But the Shaytan, he would instigate between you. They said, This is a proof that Shirk is no longer a danger for the Muslim. There's no need to talk about it and to speak about it and to learn about it. That's from Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. And Ibrahim says, protect me, O Allah, and my sons from worshipping idols. Rabbi, innahunna adlalna kathira minan nas. O my Lord, O Allah, 
shirk and the fitan of shirk has misled countless individuals. So if the Prophet needed a nighttime ritual, spiritual ritual, to worship Allah, to call upon Allah, to seek Allah's protection, Allah's help, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدْ If the Prophet needed protection from evil, from sorcery, from envy, from darkness, from creatures and insects and animals that only come out at nighttime, then what do you think about me and you, whose days are full of politics, sports, backbiting, gossiping, laughing, joking, eating, drinking, shopping, arguing, fussing, and fighting. And at best, my day is with limited dhikr, at best, if I'm not gossiping and arguing. Limited dhikr, because I gotta go to work. I have to pay bills, I have stress. My son is in college. My daughter just graduated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we need Allah's protection in our sleep more than the Prophet ﷺ needed. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Asking Allah, who is the Lord of man, the King of man, the God of man, to protect us from Iblis. Iblis who comes and he goes. Before you think, before you look, he's gone. He's whispered to you already. He withdraws immediately. Before you think about it, it's done, it's over. The thought is already in your heart and your mind. So you need protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this authentic hadith shows us, brothers and sisters, number one, is that we are in need of connecting ourselves to Allah before we go to sleep. If the Prophet did it every night, then how about us? Number two, this authentic hadith shows us the virtue of these three surahs. Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falaq, and Al-Nas in general. And the special virtue of Al-Falaq and Nas. Number three, this authentic hadith shows us and it teaches us is that the Prophet ﷺ was a practical man and his message والسلام, was practical. He did not say, I put my trust in Allah, my reliance in Allah, Allah is my protector, and then that's it. That's not what he did. Rather, he himself picked up the axe or the hatchet and he swung at the tree. He took a practical step of doing things. Last but not least, brothers and sisters, the most important thing, brothers and sisters, is for us to reflect on our sleeping habits. How do we go to sleep at night? I cannot sleep until I hear this song, my favorite song. Whether music is halal or haram. But that's the last thing that I do before I close my eyes is listen to my favorite song. I cannot sleep until I watch my favorite movie. I cannot sleep until I watch my favorite series on Netflix. I can't sleep until I watch this episode. I can't sleep until I text this person and contact this individual and they send me good night and they send me an emoji. I cannot sleep until I have a bedtime snack. I like to eat sweet things before I go to sleep or salty things before you go to sleep. There are teas specifically geared and made for sleep, chamomile tea, without no caffeine, with warm milk. That's my sleeping ritual. Or is my sleeping ritual the Quran? Tawbah. Oh Allah, forgive me for what I've done today. Oh Allah, if you choose to take my soul tonight, then take it gracefully. Don't punish me. Forgive me. Allow me to be firm in my grave. Allow my children to be righteous after I go. Oh Allah, all of the messages, all of me lecturing and barking and hollering at my children. Oh Allah, please allow them to listen when I go. Because I'm no longer there to enforce it on them. Oh Allah, allow my son to take the message. If it's your decision to take my soul tonight. How do we sleep? What is our bedtime ritual? What keeps us warm? What keeps us comfortable? What protects us in our sleep? Is it amusement? Is it play? Is it laughter? Is it eating and drinking? Is it children, women and men? Is it entertainment? Or is it the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what does this dua and the other prophetic supplications, what power does it have upon good quality sleep? upon nightmares and scary spooky dreams, upon tossing and turning, and upon other sleep disorders that so many Muslims suffer from. And you wake up late, you're irritable, you're uneasy, you're not in a good mood, you're grouchy, etc., etc., and it has an effect upon the rest of your day. So the Prophet, he taught us, he instructed us, he was an example 
that before we go to sleep every night, we should read the Quran, we should make ta'weev, we should make tahsin, we should protect ourselves, and the same applies to our children. The Prophet said we used to read the Quran upon Hassan and Hussein, his grandsons. He taught the companions to make the ruqya on themselves and on others. And the ruqya, brothers and sisters, it isn't just for jinn possession, as many people think and feel. The ruqya is not just for someone who has sihr. They're under a spell or some magic or some sorcery. Ruqya is also for preventative measures. I make ruqya on myself not to get jinn possessed, not to get sihr, not to get sick. I make ruqya on myself to protect my children from being disobedient, from being heedless, and being the victims of the evil eye. The average Muslim, he only uses ruqya like he uses Benadryl, Advil, and Excedrin. The pill is on the shelf, you pick it up, and you do what? You put it back, that's it. What prevents the migraine? What prevents the inflammation? What prevents this? It doesn't matter. But when I do feel bad, I pop the bottle and I take the pills. And this is not the purpose of the ruqya. The Qur'an and the Prophet's hadiths are meant to be before, during, and after. And it's also, there lies no doubt, brothers and sisters, this can be a key ingredient in marital bliss. Marital bliss. Imagine this. Every single night you go to sleep reading Qur'an with your wife, making dua for each other, reciting upon each other, making ruqya for each other. How many arguments are you going to get into, honestly? How many disputes are you going to have with your wife and you're going to sleep upon the dhikr of Allah versus we go to sleep talking about money or we go to sleep talking about our children or we go to sleep talking about this argument and this family member and this in-law and so on and so on and so forth. So one of the main causes behind marital discourse is both of the spouses being disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A brother contacts me, he says, Mufti, I'm having problems with my wife. Mufti, my wife is disobedient. Yes, Sheikh. She's a bad wife. I want to divorce her. I gave her the advice. I gave her the nasiha. She's not listening. She's not a good Muslim, etc., etc. Okay, no problem. Before COVID, we did counseling in person. After COVID, counseling is done online. You go over to the brother's house, and he says, this is my wife. It's time to pray. His wife doesn't pray. His wife is not covered. His wife is cursing and arguing and fussing and walking. What's going on? What is going on? How do you live with your wife in an Islamic manner? And you expect her to obey you? She doesn't obey Allah. You expect your wife to respect your rules. She doesn't respect the rules of Allah. And you allow it. And vice versa. Men and women. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضٍ Allah says the believers are protectors of each other. Friends of each other. Allies of each other. Helpers of each other. Male and female. يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ they enjoin the good, they forbid the evil, they establish prayer, they pay zakah. That's the attribute and the characteristic of the believer. So from the things which allow marital bliss is to live as man and wife as Muslims. And from that even more specifically is going to sleep in the proper Islamic way. And from that, a brief glimpse of that is this authentic hadith inside Bukhari of what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu would do each and every single night before he went to sleep. We ask Allah the Mighty and the Most High to allow this message to be clear and plain. We ask Allah Azzawajal to allow our ears to be open and our hearts to be receptive. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to allow us to sleep upon his mention and his remembrance. We ask Allah Azzawajal to give the Muslims good rest at night. We ask Allah Azzawajal to protect them from having bad thoughts, bad dreams, and bad disturbances in their sleep. We ask Allah Azza wa to cure all Muslims who have been possessed by jinn and placed under sihr. We ask Allah Azza wa to protect us from those evil vices and to make us guided and to allow us to guide others. Wa subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you.